Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to uh, this very special screening of Mercy Falls. My name's Mike Munzer. I'm a journalist and podcaster, uh, and I'm joined on stage by a lot of very special people uh, involved in the making of this film. So director and co-writer Ryan Hendrick, uh, cast member James Watterson, director of photography John Rhodes, and composer Stephen Wright. Hello, guys. Thank hello. you so much for hello. joining us. Uh, Ryan, the last movie you did was a Christmas movie, right? So tell me, how did you come to uh, approach this movie? movie, a, a horror movie, in comparison to your last project? Uh, well, it, so, it sounds very kind of um, pragmatic, but um, when Lost at Christmas came out, uh, Christmas scripts started coming through the door. So uh, I kind of figured, okay, this is going to be a thing for a while, so in, to avoid being pigeonholed, let's do something completely different. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, how, how far can you get from a, a cheesy Christmas rom-com than a, than a really dark horror film? Where did the kind of seed of this particular story and this idea kind of come from for you? Well, my kind of trademark is kind of the, the Scottish outdoors, you know, the kind of, if there's not a mountain in there, I didn't do it. Um, and I really looked at that as a, as a setting because, you know, we're making a very low budget film, how to add production value, you know, wide open spaces. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously we're looking at that, we're looking at the slasher, we're looking at the survival thriller. I love survival thrillers, I love First Blood, I love Predator. Um, and I really wanted to kind of go down that kind of route and um, come up with something. And it's, it, it's interesting because you, with things like, like the Christmas rom-com and the slasher in the woods genres, you know, there, there, are, there are rules and you dare not break those rules or straight too far from them um, or you'll be uh, slapped in the back of the head quite firmly for it. So kind of trying to play around with my own sensibilities within the genre and within the rules of that. Absolutely. Uh, John, was that the first time for you watching it on the big screen? No, I saw it at Carson Crew a little while ago, yes. Excellent. How do you find it, kind of watching your work back with an audience? Uh, it's lovely. <laughs> I really like it. And it's, you know, to see it on the big screen is great because you don't always know that Going to be on the get a distribution be seen on the big screen, and uh, you worry you know, about whether it's all going to be sharp enough and all the rest of it on the big screen. And you know, it's turned out well. I'm very happy with it. it. It's it's a beautiful film visually as well. Tell me a little bit about kind of how you began working on this project and your kind of initial approach to it. Well, a lot of it is is down to cost. You know, it's not a high budget movie. We didn't have dolly and grips and all that kind of stuff and, and track. So, so we had to kind of be a bit inventive as to how that all worked uh, with sliders and with some gimbal shots as well for the moving. But really, it's just trying to catch the beauty of the landscape. You know, that's, that's, and try and keep it moody, you know, and atmospheric. Absolutely. Uh, James, tell me a little bit about kind of your approach to your character. What, what were your thoughts when you kind of first read the script and, and kind of, you know, getting to grips with your character, I suppose? Um, I loved it. I mean, I'm a big fan of horror and kind of elevated stuff. So it was really fun. I thought, you know, it's a really exciting project. It's high stakes. It's kind of go time. I really, yeah, I really liked it. I think um, approaching the character, I mean, you know, obviously it all comes from the script and um, yeah, I really, I really liked Scott. Um, I thought he was really interesting. He wasn't your sort of typical, I don't know, macho figure that you'd find in a horror film. So I was really interested to sort of follow that avenue of the character. And um, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I just yeah. really enjoyed doing it. Yeah. I think that is a kind of interesting thing, right? That your character doesn't tick those archetype boxes yeah. necessarily. And Ryan, I want to come back to you just briefly and ask you about that and kind of in terms of creating these characters, were you keen to kind of, I, I guess, push back against the usual kind of slasher movie or horror movie archetypes in that regard? Yeah, a little bit. Um, I, you, you, can, you look at what those archetypes are and you know you kind of have to kind of tap, uh, tap have a wee nod to that here and there, but... It was really just kind of the dynamic of who these people are and you're kind of looking at a group of friends who were very similar and very close at one point, you know, kind of that kind of high school university and how they kind of start to drift and, you know, five, ten years down the line. They're not all the same people anymore and you don't necessarily have that much in common anymore. And uh, so I was interested to kind of explore that and you see kind of just how people have started to become quite different. And even though, like, Scott and Heather are... Still, there you know. Obviously, there were the the high, the, the university um, love affair, and they're still it's they're still together, 
and they really shouldn't be. They, they, they're really kind of polar opposites. So mm. on many ways, it's, there's a lot of um, the end of friendships just because people who have probably started out as these kind of architects, uh, as we're used to, uh, have drifted, have developed, have become someone else because they are... They're not all twenty-two years old. They're, they're you know they're a little bit older. You know, yeah. They've 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 graduated. They've started trying to make something of their lives. Yeah. Not that successfully, I would I would I would think. But there's just yeah, it's kind of it's almost like after the 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 time where you would have these kind of characters in a in a normal slasher. It's kind of you know yeah. if they'd gone if this had happened to them later in life. Uh, I mean, they're, they're still idiots. Um, you know, um, <laughs> they kind of want to kill each other one minute, have sex with each other the next, right? I mean, yeah, the usual. Yeah, uh, they make some very <laughs> terrible decisions, <laughs> which I think anyone would in yeah. that situation. I mean, there's that, there's that scene outside the hotel um, just before they set off where Carla said, have you set an emergency plan? And it cuts to the shot of all five of them just looking a bit dumbfounded. Mm. And I kind of, it's like, is that kind of, the more I watch it, I kind of see that shot and I just go in and shout, you're all going to die. <laughs> um, it's that point, yeah, yeah they're, they're done. Um, but I think just kind of trying to keep it, keep it real and try and think about if you're in that kind of high stake situation, mm. you don't make sensible decisions, you make stupid decisions. Yeah. Uh, which is, you know, which is why quite often uh, in real life crime as well as crime drama, you always kind of, find out that um, the reason people get caught for murder is because they think they were clever, but somewhere along the way they made a really stupid mistake. Mm -hmm. and a very small one, but that's enough. Yeah, absolutely. Tell me a little bit about creating that character of Carla as well then. Again, like, slightly different to your usual archetypal kind of slasher killer, I suppose. Like, tell me a little bit about creating that character, her past and that kind of thing. Um, I just, I wanted to do something a little different. What I didn't want was a big macho, muscly guy running around the woods after everyone. Mm. Um, I wanted to have a different flair in in that area, um, and you know, there's kind of, there's there's little similarities to things like uh, like the hunted or first blood, uh, with um, with the kind the background of the character, but um, I just wanted to tell it f from the female perspective. I thought it would it would create a different um, idea of threat. I mean, there's a a lot of although she is very physical and quite um, um, concise and calculating, there is this sort of uh, sort of beautiful threatening quality to her. You know, that's why we kind of hint at the kind of, the kind of siren-esque kind of uh, vibe behind her. And it's just the kind of, because you have the opportunity uh, having um, a female antagonist to approach it from a different direction and tap into different ideas that maybe you could, that you certainly could not if you were, you know, if it was Jason Voorhees or somebody running around yeah. there. How inevitable was it what happened to them? Like, did Carla go into that situation knowing she was going to kill them all? Or had it not been for, you know, some of these characters acting stupidly, wounding each other, she had to do what she had to do, right? How, you know, was that or was that always her plan? How did you see it? Oh, that was never the plan. Yeah. Uh, Carla is looking for a quiet life. She's trying to right. disappear and hide. Um, and it's, it's purely instinctual. Yeah. Um, the kind of comparable to the, the scene in the desert uh, with uh, the Afghan lady. It, it's literally, it's become... She, you know, brutally pragmatic in her approach, and it's a very sort of primal instinct yeah. uh, that she's kind of started to come out of through therapy and different things and the time that's gone since. But when she's put into that high-stress situation, it's snapped straight back into purely pragmatic on that very kind of primal level. Mm -hmm. So it's literally doing what needs to be done. So, you know, Andy, she's, putting, she's doing him a favour put him out of his midget because he's going to bleed out anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the point, and it's literally after that, I think she believes that she's convinced him to kind of go along with her ridiculous plan. Mm -hmm. But it's the betrayal and the betrayal from, you know, Donnie because she believes that, she, that he was on her side. So it, it's, it's, it is literally about um, uh, that, that, that betrayal that sets her off. Um, not, it's not about being pragmatic. It's literally they're a threat to her now because she, she's, avoid, she's running away, she's avoiding going back to, to prison, going back to hospital, yeah. and, you know, they're going to expose her. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very much, um, you know, kill or be killed. So it could have all been avoided. There you go. Uh, <laughs> um, Stephen, tell me a little bit about approaching this movie. You know, again, so much, so it's so important, right, with a horror movie to create the kind of soundscape, the score that really gets audiences kind of the adrenaline going. Tell me a little bit about how you approached this yeah, particular I think this movie. Is my fifth screening, including a couple of sound checks. I'm getting a bit jaded. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there was two main factors in it, really, um, and Brian stole my word. 
there earlier because I was going to say the, the main one was um, almost Lord of the Flies like it was, mm. it was very primal uh, for me almost tribal yeah in some ways you know um, so, so that was a key thing but unlike a lot of um, um, typical slasher movies it, it actually had some real background to the characters and some substance and some reason to emote yeah and it was it was it was trying to create that juncture and flow yeah between these two things so that that was key that was my initial key approach yeah you've got to kind of ride uh, those sort of tonal differences i suppose yeah. as well like there's some beautiful music when you know like get rona's sort of flashback um to her childhood and that kind of thing like do you kind of kind of um, I guess, like, create different kind of themes for t particular characters or different moods or anything like that when you were well, approaching it? I started off this film more in a way of um, spending a great deal of time creating um, quite a large palette of um, sonic material mm. before I even wrote a single thing uh, cause, because I wanted to get it sonically consistent and right first. Mm. And, then, and then it was um, a case of... Um, Ryan sometimes leaning over me going, do something. <laughs> <laughs> and and, me, and me, me taking the rip and playing the Jaws theme and all sorts of different things, you know, but I, and then eventually being serious and actually doing it. <laughs> how, how difficult is it to kind of strike that balance too between, you know, getting the music kind of, how important is it, I suppose, in a horror movie to give us those big kind of jump scare music moments versus the, the more kind of low key sort of ominous dread, I suppose, that runs throughout? Um, yeah, I, th I think um, the impact of, uh, of some of the jump stuff, um, I, I, do, I worry about cliches sometimes, but th then to go back to what Ryan said earlier about formula, it's like, you know, there's things you just can't get away from. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, so, so you, you need to do that. The test of me was actually my, my sister tonight, who's in the audience, um, who, who basically um, sunk her talons into my leg at all the right moments. <laughs> so, it might, so it must have worked. You know? That's what you want, right? Yeah, That's yeah. what you want. Um, James, when you watch the film with audiences, are you able to kind of watch it as an audience member, get involved? Do you get scared by watching movies like this on the big screen or are you too kind of out of it? I mean, I, I'm i such a scaredy cat. Like, <laughs> horror films terrify me. Like, anything, anything like this would, like, scare me usually. Obviously, being in it, you know, you see how it's all been done, you know, the ins and outs of it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how many actors enjoy watching themselves on screen because you always pick yourself apart and you're like, why did I do this? Why did I do that? What's wrong with my face, my forehead? Um, uh, but yeah, it's really good. You know, I think the story's great. I think everyone in it is great. So it's, I think everyone's so good in it and everything about the film is so good that I can sort of forget about myself actually watching it and actually enjoy the whole product as a kind of finished thing. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying it and I hope people like it as well. Absolutely. John, did you take any kind of references or inspiration from any kind of classic horror or, or any genre movies when kind of you were approaching the look of this movie? No, not, <laughs> <laughs> not remotely. Not, not at all. No, I, I, um, I think I obviously read the script and get an idea how it's going to feel, but I'm, I'm not a um, grungy sort of cameraman. I like things to look as beautiful as I can make them within the confines of the script, and that's what I always try and do and make things look lovely. And, and uh, that tells the picture, you know, that tells the story. Uh, so no, I didn't really take a reference from anything. How grueling slash challenging was this shoot? Because it looked like it must have been a, a lot, you know, filming outdoors like this. It, it certainly had its moments. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, weather, weather, weather. You know, that's, <laughs> uh, and it, it, it doesn't matter if it's raining and it doesn't matter if it's sunny. But it does matter when it changes every 10 minutes so if you're trying to get some sort of continuity in how everything looks. So that is, you know, that is a problem. And at difficult locations, to get to and to film in. Uh, but, you know, everyone's very good nature. We just get on with it. We do it. We enjoy it. Fantastic. James, how was it for you? Are you quite an outdoorsy person? How was this shoot for you? <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Yeah, you know, it was challenging. There, there were moments where it was cold and wet and windy and just waiting for the right conditions. Um, you know, watching that back when Joe and Nicolette get into the war at Mercy Falls. Oh, alive. I can feel the cold. I remember that day, that was a cold, cold day into night. Um, 
and I left them quite early on. I was like, bye guys, enjoy the rest of the evening. <laughs> um, but it's great, you know, being outdoors and stuff, like it, it just adds to the sort of drama and the stakes of everything. You kind of, yeah, whipped up in a bit of a frenzy, especially when the weather's that volatile as well. Yeah. Really helpful. Yeah. It looked cold, was it? What time of year was it? Freezing. <laughs> it was March. Okay, yeah. yeah. March like, in Scotland. Cold, cold, cold Scotland. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Ryan, how was this for you, kind of directing this shoot on location? I had a ball. Yeah. Uh, everyone else had a hard time. I had a, I had a great time. Uh, I don't, I don't mind the cold and the wet. I'm coming from a very sort of guerrilla filmmaking background. I'm used to being out and about in just you know long hours, and uh, and it's part of the thrill. You're kind of running on adrenaline when you're doing that, and you kind of because you 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 don't get the you never stop. You don't get the opportunity to sit down and actually think about stuff. You kind of you turn up on the day, and then suddenly you've got people. You've got all sorts of people with you know hundred questions. Um, and you're just constantly answering these questions and making decisions, and then before you know it, you've shot the day. Mm. You kind of feel bad when, uh, you know, people are, have got to do a lot more heavy lifting than you, or, you know, like Jamie said, the actors have to go in the water in March. Uh, I mean, I think one of the first calls I had with Lauren, she said to me, uh, this feels like a summer film to me. I went, okay, well, we can either be cold, wet and miserable in March, or we can be warm and dry and eaten alive by the midges. What would you like to do? Uh, so we went for we went for the, the the cold approach, but it's you know that's just filming in the outdoors. Um, but it, uh, it's it's good when you go through the hell of filming in like that cave and it comes off and you see the kind of production value that it adds. I mean we're all standing up there at the top of this hill at this cave, uh, at, you know three in the morning. It's wet. We're all miserable. And you know, then you then you you, you shoot the, the scene where she lights up the flare, and you're like, yeah, okay, yeah. that's why we're here. Uh, and when that comes, when that when that works, and it it works on a big screen, you're like, okay, it was worth the pain. Absolutely incredible. Uh, the locations as well were so beautiful. Where exactly were you? Where what locations were you at when you were filming? Oh, we were everywhere. Right. Um, we were in Stirlingshire. We were down at Loch Lomond for a while. Uh, Whereabouts were the falls? The actual the falls. The, the falls. Uh, I think the falls and the cave were the two trickiest locations to actually find because mm. they're very specific in the script what they need to be. Um, so that's a, a, on a little road up just behind a little town called Greenock uh, on the River Clyde where they have all the kind of the, the shipbuilding and the, the naval bases and whatnot. And it's just sort of, you go up this tiny wee road behind this very built up area of schools and whatnot and factories and then just suddenly you feel like you're on, you're on Shetland. Funnily enough, that's where they shoot a lot of Shetland. Um, <laughs> But, and it's just, it's amazing where you can just turn a corner in Scotland and you have a completely different vibe. Mm. Um, so we found the waterfall up there because, you know, you've got all these practical things to worry about. Okay, it's great if you find an amazing location, but how do you, how do you hike a crew of 40 and all this kit two miles off road? Mm -hmm. You can't. So you need to be as close to a road as humanly possible, um, which was fine for the, the waterfall. Uh, but for the cave, it was, you know, it was on the side of Loch Tay, just a few miles out of Aberfeldy, along a single track road in a farmer's field about, what, maybe 100 feet up, at an angle of about that. Um, and we're trying to get kit up on quad bikes and uh, it's night shoot, so it's dark, it's lighting, the, you've got to get things like toilets out there and, and you've got to get the catering out there. And it's just, it, yeah, it becomes a military operation. Uh, and it's one little thing goes wrong and you're screwed. Yeah, I can imagine. And, you know, John mentioned, you know, making that film look as beautiful as possible, and it is so beautiful. I was just wondering, are you worried when you're directing a horror movie? You know, how was it for you striking that balance of, yes, you want to make it look as gorgeous as possible, and there's so much of it that takes place in the, you know, in the, you know, the daylight, so you can really take it all in. But at the same time, you want to make a kind of creepy, scary kind of, you know, movie, don't you? How was that for you in, in terms of striking that balance, I suppose? Um, well, I think it was it was interesting because instead of looking for references to kind of try and mirror things that we've done before, it's kind of making the best possible. Mm. And you kind of pick locations that are sort of quite overbearing and, and quite dark and moody. And um, beauty can, you know, darkness can have beauty. Yeah. It, it, if you say beauty, it doesn't mean, uh, you know, white, red and Christmassy. So it, it, it's int it was really, it was fun for me to kind of, sort of watch John sort of bring that approach to things. Mm. Uh, and this is our third film together now, so we kind of kind of know what the other wants. Um, and each of the three films have been completely different from the other. 
Uh, and I would say they all look as beautiful as one another, but completely different. I love that. And I would love to ask you guys about how you kind of approach the different kind of elements of horror and, and different scares as well. But I mean, Stephen, did you kind of take any inspiration from any kind of classic horror when you were creating the score for this? Ooh, um, nothing in particular. The only, uh, funnily enough, the film that um, came to mind, the only one um, specifically I remember coming floating into my head was not technically a horror film, it was actually Apocalypto. Right, yeah. Um, and uh, because uh, I'd, that's going back to the primal tribal nature, mm, mm -hmm. and uh, I think um, um, David uh, David Peachy Bikich, who also uh, he he worked on the Post Sound, um, I got the feel you know you, you hear the kind of primal screams and all the stuff that are in the sound design, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, working with him in the dub, pulling that all together, so it was really there was a great continuity. Uh, sort of thing. But that was, the, that was the film I specifically uh, it, it popped into mind and that was enough. <laughs> was there anything of kind of Scottish origin that you wanted to play into the music and the score as well? Obviously there's that moment in the bar where we've got the Scottish band, but was there anything like in the score itself that kind of played into that? <laughs> um, not specifically because I'm, I'm kind of on... I'm, I'm somewhat allergic to cliches. <laughs> um, so you didn't want any like Wicker Man, Maypole type music. No, thing. I, I wanted I wanted it to be quite universal. Um, yeah, and uh, just um, buck that trend at the moment because I, th I think all the scenery and and the fact that all the accents does that enough. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't need assisted by shortbread. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think, John, do you think about kind of creating scares when you're framing something up or, or does that come kind of more on Ryan's part in the edit or in the score or whatever? Well, no, I think it's in, the, it's in the staging of the scene. So, yeah. yes, of course, you think about it because it, it will change how you shoot it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's in the blocking of the scene to make sure that that comes out. And then, of course, the editing after that. Very important. Yeah. yeah. Are you a horror fan generally? Not particularly. No? Because <laughs> <laughs> no. it feels like, uh, I, I don't know if you've noticed this, James, like, it does feel like horror movies at the moment are kind of having a real moment. I feel like people kind of are really flocking to movies like this and they want to be scared and they want to kind of em embrace horror. Um, it feels like more than ever at the moment. Like, uh, uh, do you think there's a reason for that, of why at the moment horror is having such a, a moment? Um, I mean, look around, man. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I think... Um... It's just really creative, you know, it's, it's fun, it's escapism, it's, you know, there's this big fascination with um, true crime. Yes. So, like, you know, horrors probably riding that wave as well. But, you know, you've got so many, you've got the, what is it, Talk To Me that's just come out mm. and Ready or Not and uh, Midsummer, and The Ritual as well, actually. I watched that film uh, when I was sort of prepping for this, like Friends, Lost in the Wood in Sweden. And it's just different ways that you can approach you know, formats that we might be familiar with, but how can you sort of mess with that? How can you reinvent it? How do you keep people coming back for that? Um, yeah, I think it's just, it's really fun. So it's really fun to be like, thank God that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. It's something quite cathartic, I suppose, isn't it, I think. Ryan, do you find that too, that like, you know, horror is a very, it feels like quite a popular lucrative genre right now to kind of tap into. Oh, absolutely. And I think it's because what is horror? You can't quite define horror yeah. in a, into one particular type of movie. Um, it springs across all, all manner of subgenres, you know, whether it's survival, thriller, or it's uh, body horror, sci-fi, supernatural, whatever. Uh, so there's a lot of potential. So there's a, there's a big audience out there, and it's the, probably the biggest genre where you can, where you are creatively quite free to kind of go in the direction that you want to go. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to entirely you know, I was talking about rules, but you can stick to those rules without having to just making a film to those rules. You can make the film the film you want to make for yeah. yourself, whilst you know remaining within that in that ballpark. Yeah, absolutely. Stephen, do you scare easily? Are you a horror fan? Um, I used to. It's re speaking about jaded. It's really weird. I remember you know being young and being frightened of the um, Evil Dead. Yeah, and I, I, and now I look at it and it makes me laugh. So, <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah, I, uh, um, I think I can get into something and get, and for it to be gripping is really good, mm -hmm. and the tension mm -hmm. in your in your moment. 
but it's almost like I'd like to go back to these early days when I could actually get genuinely terrified. Yeah, that's know, right. And, yeah. and kind of like it. <laughs> yeah, Evil Dead, the original kind of Cabin in the Woods movie, which this is also, right, in a way. Um, and I wondered, Ryan, as well, like how, how did you approach like different types of ways in which you horrify people in this movie? Because obviously, you know, you've got everything from kind of conventional kind of jump scares to survivalist stuff, and then you've got some gnarly gore as well, right? But tell me about kind of, I guess, pulling off that balance of the way in which you scare people. Um, I kind uh, when I'm kind of, when I'm writing it, I kind of try and put myself in the shoes of the of the person causing the action or you know who's responsible. Uh, and you kind of why what is what is she what what is her way of thinking at the time where she kills a particular person? Uh, I mean, you you could say like Donnie's death is probably the most brutal, mm -hmm. but that that is that is out of pure rage of the betrayal of because of the intimacy between the two of them. Uh, and then you kind of move forward, and you know Heather is put on display. That that is, you know, Carla is deliberately fucking with Rona, um, yeah. and that is why she is killed in that manner. Mm -hmm. And it's it's so it's get, uh, and you're just trying to you're trying to give it a bit of a flair. You don't want to keep repeating yourself as well. Um, my co-writer is American, so it was like I, I think I think there needs to be a gun in this. Scene. It's like it's like yeah, that's not a thing here. So uh, you kind of have the sort of the, the sort of the the culture barrier between yeah. the what um, what's standard in America and what we have here. Mm -hmm. So um, the kind of the very strict gun control that we have here. It's like well, you know, none of these guys are farmers, so they're not going to have a shotgun. Yeah. Uh, so it's just trying to be clever about the resources that the characters have. Mm. Uh, but you're also thinking at the same time as the director thinking, how the hell am I going to do this? Yeah. Um, and you have to think about the you kind know, of the logistical concerns of how you do that. So I mean, the most probably the most terrifying one for me was um, when Heather is, is strung up a tree. Um, although it's you know it's very technical with you know you know with a, a special effects guy who's trained to do cert certain things yeah. and harnesses and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's just kind of you. You're still putting a bit of rope around somebody's neck. It's not yeah. connected to anything, but yeah. it still puts the fear of God in you because you're you're sending them up high, yeah. as opposed to people on the ground having prosthetics and different wounds sort of applied to them, and it's all about the the, the camera work trickery or the, and the performance. So, yeah, I think I think I think there's different ways to do it. I mean, I think for me the most the brutalest death in the film, uh, I think, is Jamie's death. Yes. Um, <laughs> and it's the one you see the least of in terms of uh, gore. Yeah. Um, but it's the again, it's it's the intimacy of it. It's the performance uh, that really kind of you, I, I find that quite harrowing. Yeah. Um, so again, it doesn't have to be all the effects and all the gore. Uh, you can be very very intimate and be incredibly disturbing. Yeah. Was it all done kind of in camera, all that stuff as well, in terms of the gore and the effects? Was that all practical? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was uh, entirely practical. There was one little visual effect trick um, where, um, when Joe's killed with uh, the axe. Um, it all, it's, all, it's all real uh, in prosthetics and the, kind of the, the blade put in here, but when she pulls it out and it disappears off, uh, the blade you see here is, uh, is CGI. That just right, right. that flicks back out. Um, it's a very subtle thing. It's very hard to spot, but it just adds that little element of oh, um, oh and it's you know it's camera movement, it's sound design, you know that big crunch, um, and it, yeah. So yeah, everything everything on that front was practical. We didn't set Nicolette on fire. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming, and thank you for joining me on stage, Ryan, James, John, and Stephen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Right.